You want the moon? Just say the word and I'll throw a lasso around it and pull it down. Hey, that's a pretty good idea. I'll give you the moon, Mary. Why, yes, George, I'll take it. But a lasso will never work. We have got to science this up. Because I've been feeling a little bit of evil genius tendencies in my social isolation. So I think it's time that we stole... The All right, so I can't take credit for the initial idea to steal the moon. That came from a very curious subscriber on Twitter who is intrigued by this idea that gravity is so much weaker than the other forces. And so he said, could you, in theory, use a magnet to steal the moon? Now you can't use sort of one magnet on Earth and one magnet on the moon to do this because both of those magnets would have the north and south pole, you know, one of which was tracks and one of which re repels. So you would essentially attract and repel the moon by the same amount if you used normal magnets. But the core of the moon, just like the core of the Earth, is made from iron. So there's already metal over there that we can use to drag it towards us. But we don't want to use a permanent magnet because then we wouldn't be able to control it. But what we can use is something called an electromagnet. The kind that's used to lift cars around scrap heaps. The kind that you can turn on and off. Now if you remember back to high school physics, you might have done a little experiment where you set up a light bulb attached to a coil of wire and then move a magnet in and out of the coil of wire. And while the magnet is moving, you set up an electric current which powers the light bulb and causes it to turn on. This happens because electric fields and magnetic fields are intrinsically linked. It's why we call the whole area of physics electromagnetism. You can't separate the two. So what an electromagnet does is the opposite of that. Instead of moving the magnet in the coil to set up an electric field to power the light bulb, you run an electric current through the wire and that sets up a magnetic field. And the applications for electromagnets are endless. You know, they're used everywhere from generators to motors to loudspeakers to headphones to MRI machines to like old school VCR and tape recorders to huge big particle accelerators that are used in physics experiments. And the reason they're so versatile is because the strength of the electromagnet that you make depends on how many coils and wire you have and then the amount of current that you pass through those coils of wire as well. So for those electromagnets that are designed specifically to lift things, like cars on scrap heaps, they're designed, you know, to attract metal towards them, which is exactly what we need if we're gonna steal the moon. So thankfully the force that an electromagnet like that can apply to a piece of metal, or the iron core of the moon, is actually really well known. It's a very well known equation and it looks a little bit like this. The force is equal to the number of coils that you have, squared, times by the current running through those coils of wire, squared, the cross-sectional area of the magnet you have, i.e. how big is your magnet, times again by the permeability of free space or a vacuum. So essentially how permeable is empty space to a magnetic field running through it? Like does it resist the magnetic field running through it? And that's all divided by two times by the distance between the magnet and the piece of metal you're trying to attract squared. Because let's face it, everything is inversely proportional to the distance squared in physics. So if we want to steal the moon, this L, the distance between the magnet and the piece of metal you're trying to attract, is just the distance between the Earth and the moon. We know that. We also know this mu naught, as it's called, this permeability of a vacuum, of free space, and we know that that's a constant. It's been measured, it's very well known. But we want to work out how big a magnet we need to attract the moon from its orbit to us on Earth. So we need to get at this cross-sectional area. So we need to build a big enough electromagnet to move it from its current orbit to where it is now. Assuming, of course, that we can build some sort of shield between the electromagnet and Earth so that we don't just like crush the magnet <laughs> into the surface of the Earth towards the Earth's iron core. But assuming that we can do that, because we're evil geniuses and we can figure that out, that aside, how much force do we need? 
All right, well, let's assume we're gonna do this when the moon is closest to us in its orbit. So the moon's orbit isn't a perfect circle, it's oval shaped, so sometimes it's closer, what we call perigee, and sometimes it's further away, what we call apogee. And when it's at perigee, when it's closest to us, is when we get these super moons that the media likes to hype up. And we have one actually coming up this month in April as well, so look out for that. So this is a perfect time to steal the moon. So when the moon is at its closest point to us, it's at 356,500 kilometers away. And to make things nice and simple, I'm just gonna assume the moon has a nice circular orbit with a radius of that distance away. And what we wanna essentially do is bring the moon into an orbit that is essentially the diameter of the moon, i.e. if it was orbiting the Earth, the Earth and the moon's surface would be just touching. And I'm assuming that future evil genius Becky will figure that one out to figure out what to do with it once it's there. But that's what we essentially want to do, right? If we want to claim the moon as ours. So if we were going to draw this, it would look like this. We would have the normal orbit of the moon, here's Earth in the center, and we want to bring it to this orbit here. And luckily for us, transferring an object from one orbit to another like that is a very well-known problem in astrodynamics. I've got a better way. Astrodynamics. Yeah. It's called a Hohmann transfer orbit, and it's usually used for things like satellites, from taking them from like a low Earth orbit just after they've been launched up to a higher orbit, say like a, a geostationary orbit where it stays above the same point on the surface of the Earth all the time. Things like weather satellites and communication satellites, TV satellites do that. To do that, you have to change the velocity of the satellite. Usually if you want to go higher, you have to increase the velocity of the satellite. And by doing that, you put it on what's called a transfer orbit. So an orbit that isn't circular, like the two it's trying to go between, but one that is oval in shape that takes you from one orbit to the other. So that's exactly what we want to do here with the moon, right? We essentially want a nice oval transfer orbit that will bring us from the current moon's orbit down to the stolen moon's orbit. And again, there's some really well-known equations to work out what the change in velocity you need is going to be. So first of all, you need a change in velocity to take you out of your current orbit and put you on the transfer orbit. That's something called delta V1. So delta essentially means the change in velocity you'll need. And that depends on the gravitational constant big G. It also depends on the mass of the Earth because that's the mass of the thing that we're orbiting around here. And it depends on the two radiuses of the orbit. So the radius of the first orbit that you're leaving and the radius of the second orbit that you're trying to get into. And then you also need to know the change in velocity to get out of the transfer orbit and into the new orbit as well, and that's what's called delta v2. So for our two different radii that we're switching between, it means that we would have to slow down the moon by 829 meters per second. And the moon usually orbits at about a kilometer a second, so a thousand meters a second. So we really do have to slow it down a lot in order to be able to take it out of its current orbit. But that's the velocity and not the force that we need. And it's the force we need to know to work out how big our electromagnet has to be to be able to do this. Now, one thing that's probably been drilled into all of us in any physics class ever is that force is mass times acceleration. And what is an acceleration? It's a change of velocity in a certain time. So we can express that again as delta V, a change in velocity. The delta here means the change. So it's delta V over delta T. Now this is where things start to get a little bit iffy. Not that it wasn't really iffy before because we we're trying to steal the moon. But anyway, stick with me. Because the Hohmann transfer orbit equations that we used before to calculate the change in velocity we would need assume that that change in velocity happens instantaneously, i.e. immediately with no weight, t equals zero. But of course, if we try and work out the acceleration where we divide by the time it takes for the velocity change to happen and that time is zero, then we're gonna get like infinite acceleration, which is not exactly realistic. Now we're just doing what physicists call a back of the envelope calculation here. It doesn't have to be super accurate because in case anyone didn't realize yet, I'm not being serious. 
an April Fool, so it doesn't have to be super accurate because I'm not actually trying to steal the moon. At least, that's what I want you to think. So let's assume that this change in velocity here happens in a second. So delta t equals 1. It makes our numbers nice and simple anyway, and it's fairly realistic. This is probably as close to instantaneous as we can get. It basically means that we have to fire up this big electromagnet that we're going to build for a second, and that should be able to provide enough force to move the moon out of its orbit. Then all we have to do is balance these two equations. But the problem is we still don't know how many coils of wire we have, n, or the current running through them, i. And we're trying to work out the size of the electromagnet here. Maybe a radius instead of an area would be a better thing to work with. If we do that, then the cross-sectional area of the magnet is just pi r squared, and the maximum number of coils that we can fit around it, again, back of the envelope, not getting into the nitty gritty here, but we can assume that it's essentially the circumference of the circle divided by the diameter of the wire we're using. So let's substitute those in and then solve for r, the size of the electromagnet. Then we get r, to the power of four, i.e. r times r times r times r, is the mass of the moon times by the distance between the moon and the earth squared, times by the change in velocity we need, times by the diameter of the wire squared, all divided by two times pi cubed, times by the current squared, times by the permeability of the vacuum, times by the time that this change in velocity happens in. <gasps> Now the other problem is that the wire you use for your electromagnet, you can't just put an endless amount of current running through the wire because you'll heat up the wire like crazy and you will probably melt it. So what I did was look up the standard width of a copper wire, which is the, you know, the usual metal that you use for wiring, and found that it was about 11 millimeters in diameter and it was rated to have a maximum current flowing through it of 260 amps. So I figured let's use those numbers and we'll work out what is the size of the electromagnet we need to build if we were going to use those standard wire that we can easily, you know, get our hands on and no one will suspect that we're doing anything particularly evil geniusy. So plug in all of those numbers and we get a radius for our electromagnet of 2,661,545 kilometers. That's four times bigger than the sun. So we have a problem here. Houston, we have a problem. So I guess that's not going to be possible. So let's think about what is kind of possible. I guess the maximum size of an electromagnet that we could build here on Earth would be the size of the Earth. Okay, there's some interesting engineering considerations in there, but we're super evil geniuses. Is Genii? Geniuses? Is? We're super evil geniuses. Is. We could be able to figure that out, surely. So assuming that we figure out how to build an electromagnet the size of the Earth, then what diameter of wire and current would we need to make it so that it could give us enough force to bring the moon to us? So the radius of the Earth is 6,378 kilometers. If we assume that is the same radius as the electromagnet we can build, and we rearrange this equation for the diameter of the wire divided by the current in the wire, we find that has to be less than 0.0000000129 millimeters per amps. So to minimize that, we need to make D as small as possible, and we need to make I as big as possible. So we're going to need to get the smallest wire that we possibly can. So I sort of dived into the engineering literature as much as I can, which was a fun little trip for an astrophysicist, let me tell you. But I found that the smallest minimum size wire that you could get is 25.4 micrometers or 0.00254 millimeters, which is about the width of a human hair, which I thought was mind-blowing. Like, round of applause for engineers on that one. Like, maybe that's not that impressive, but I thought it was impressive. Now, if we plug that number in, even with that width, we would need a current of 196,847 amps, or 196 kiloamps, if you prefer. Now, assuming that the wire could actually 
survive that level of current being pushed through it, which it probably couldn't, it would probably melt, let's be honest. Ooh, perhaps it's made of something else that it would be resistant to having that current through it. Maybe it's not made of copper, maybe it's made of vibranium. Vibranium, yeah, strongest metal on earth. Okay, so problem of melting wire solve, let's just make it out of vibranium. Where are we gonna find 196 kiloamps of electricity? Because, you know, like most household objects run on like, three to 10 amps, not 196 kiloamps. Sorry, but the only power source capable of generating 1.21 gigawatts of electricity is a bolt of lightning. What did you just say? A bolt of lightning. Great, Scott, that's it, 1.21 gigawatts. 1.21 gigawatts. Great, Scott. So that meant it was time to do some research on lightning. Now the average lightning bolt tends to give you a current of about five kiloamps, which admittedly when I read that I was ever so slightly disappointed. Then I found a paper by Rakov from 2012 who sort of looked at the statistics of lightning bolts and said that actually 0.8% of all lightning bolts in the world carry a current of over 200 kiloamps. That's exactly what we need, except there's always another problem. <laughs> and that is that most lightning discharges in about 0.1 of a second. So pretty fast. And if you remember before, we assumed that the change in velocity for the home and transfer orbit would happen in a second, because it had to be as close to instantaneous as possible. And I thought a second was a good enough sort of time to go with. If instead we use 0.1 seconds, because that's the amount of time that we could get 200 kiloamps for running through our coil of wire and assume that that's the time that that force and that velocity change has to occur for, if we've only got 0.1 seconds, then instead our diameter of our wire divided by the current that we can have through it is 0.0000000004 millimeters per amps, which that number isn't exactly that much smaller than the number we had before, but it means that if again we use our vibranium wire that's about the width of a human hair, we would need a current of 622 kiloamps, not 200 kiloamps, which would mean you'd need like three of the incredibly rare lightning strikes to all hit at exactly the same time. You know, even evil geniuses, they can't compete with statistics. So it looks like I'm gonna have to go back to the drawing board on this one. Um, maybe I should design some sort of craft to take me to the moon and I'll use like a photon light sail to use the radiation from photons from the sun hitting into it to provide the thrust to give me the velocity change on the moon and maybe that way I can steal the moon? Huh. Maybe leave it with me. What? You never seen an evil genius with pink nails before? They look fabulous. You stole the whole of the moon. So for our, so for our, <clears throat> do you mind, Mr. Motorbike? 1.21 gigawatts, whoop, whoop, whoop. Buffalo gals, won't you come out tonight? Won't you come out tonight? Won't you come out tonight? <laughs> no, it's not good enough. Ha, 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 ha,